Looking up Euler's identity, you come across such quotes as the greatest equation ever. Absolutely paradoxical, we cannot understand it and we don't know what it means. I is a number that doesn't exist. Being a theoretical physicist, I was always confused by this apparent conflict. How can the greatest equation ever contain quantities that don't exist? But going back to a line of thought clearly expressed by Sir William Rowan Hamilton, there's a way to understand every symbol in Euler's identity just using common sense. To do that, it's easiest to go way back and imagine mathematics is just being invented. So picture sitting beside a fire and recollecting heroic deeds from the hunt. Sure, you would want to record the number of animals you managed to run down. Like a modern YouTuber collects clicks. Beginning with teddy marks scratched into a wolf bone, the symbolic representation has evolved through the millennia to the now commonly used Hindu-Arabic numeral system. Now let's fast forward to year 1878. In this article, Applications of Grassmann's Extensive Algebra, William Kingdon Clifford writes, Now there are two sides to the notion of a product. When we say 2 times 3 equals 6, we may regard the product 6 as a number derived from the numbers 2 and 3 by a process in which they play similar parts. Or we may regard it as derived from number 3 by the operation of doubling. In the former view, 2 and 3 are both numbers. In the later view, 3 is a number, but 2 is an operation. And the two factors play very distinct parts. Now that we know we are dealing with operations and objects, our goal is to find specific examples in the world around us. Let's start with objects. Everybody is used to the number concept as a symbolic representation of how many things there are in a collection of objects. Coming from a hunter-gatherer background, equally intuitive for us humans are arrows, a second kind of object. But wait, let's choose a partial name. Vector should fit. Symbolically, we will represent them with letters. So now that we got vectors, we got to take a look at what kind of operations can act upon them. We can dilate, rotate and flip them. Or we just do nothing at all and call it the identity. As we have seen, many cultures use different symbols for the same number. Let's see if we can find simple shorthand notations for these operations. Dilations, check. Rotations, nah, that's too soon. That's coming up in a few minutes. The flip, let's see if minus one works. The identity, now one will definitely work here. In the real world, these operations are followed one after another. As an example, consider the flip. And then another one. Surprise, it's the vector we started with, which we can write as one times a. In shorthand notation we have, let's see if we can swap the brackets. With a little mathematical swag we could ask if the product is associative. From a picture above the result has to be clearly the vector itself, written here as 1 times a. So for our symbols to work properly we have to have the rule minus 1 times minus 1 equals plus 1 which you know from school and is seen here as a symbolic representation of the self-evident geometric fact that two flips result in the same vector. So now that we have a common sense interpretation of the first symbol in e to the i pi equals minus 1, let's move on to the next. Wait, I don't see a symbol. What do you want with these 90 degree rotations anyway? Bear with me. Evidently, two 90 degree rotations have the same result as a flip. Symbolically, we have The square is just a shorthand notation for two operations in a row. If you merely write out the symbols for the operations, we get And if you take the square root, we have Oh no! We are not supposed to take the square root of negative numbers, or rv. Sir William, take it away. Thus, every right radial is in the present system one of the square roots of negative unity and may therefore be said to be one of the values of the symbol square root of minus one. We see that we have found a perfectly clear and geometrically real interpretation for the square root of minus one.
Like we have seen for the number 3, the symbolic representation has changed in the course of history. Let's add another symbol for a 90 degree rotation. Maybe I will fit. Since in our 3 dimensional space we have infinitely many planes we can rotate in, there are infinitely many square roots of minus 1. This led Hamilton to the invention of his famous quaternions. But that's a whole other story. It's time for a short summary. Minus 1, check. I got that. Two down, two to go. Rowan, we need a flash of inspiration here. Okay. You mean a flip results in the same vector as a rotation of 180 degrees? Seems self-evident. What are you up to now? Two. Three. N I get it. So what's with the circle? Oh man, why did you spoil it? We know these formulas. One, two, three. So if the vector would be made of rope, we could approximately wrap it around the semicircle 3.14 times. Now for a look at a small rotation of 180 degrees over n. Got that. Why the rotated vector? Ah, I see. The blue vector and the black one are almost equal to the green one. Let's have a look at the symbolic representation. Oh man, that's just what I said. Be patient, we are almost there. Now you are telling me you need these fancy symbols to tell me that a half turn is the same as many little turns one after another? At this point you are only plugging in the result from the previous slide. And to make it worse, it's only approximately true. So now that we are finished, let us stop the silly chit chat with Sir William and take a look at what we got. To make the approximation better, we have to make the rotation smaller and smaller as we take n to infinity. Our argument is done, and what is left for us to do is to translate our result into the commonly used notation, like translating Roman numerals on a decaying temple into a number system. But maybe take a minute and try it for yourself. That's enough. Let's check out the internet for help. Using the result from Wikipedia we can write Or if you're really lazy, we write e to the pi rotation of 90 degrees. So now that we got everything together, just enjoy. A remark at the end. Euler's identity e to the i pi equals minus 1 is an abstract algebraic identity. I just showed you one concrete geometric realization of this quite general result. If you know of more, write them in the comments. At the end, I got a challenge for you. Just kidding, that's no challenge for a digital native. But here is one I'm curious about. Show me a version of Euler's identity that doesn't use the general exponential function, but that really uses Euler's number. See you next time for more common sense.